Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Hacking Point of Sale, How Everyone Can Learn from the Compromise of Mega Retailers. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm very excited to be part of today's webcast. Uh, before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First of all, you want to make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Uh, the, the audio portion will stream through your PC uh, or your laptop speakers. So be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting in Windows or Mac OS, or your headset to ensure that it's turned on and volume is at an audible level. In Windows, you, can normally, you will normally see a speaker volume icon in the bottom right, as many of you know. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. Uh, you can click on the expand rectangle on the top corner of the slide to enlarge it. Um, if you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can go ahead and refresh uh, your browser or hit the F5 to refresh. So if you have any te technical difficulty today, uh, please click on the Help widget, and that is a question mark icon, and it covers common te technical issues that you might experience. Uh, uh, regarding the presentation, if you have a question for our presenters, you can click the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. Uh, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so um, we'll make sure to get to as many questions as possible. And lastly, I'll be sending out a link uh, to the on-demand version of the webcast uh, today and a link to the slides, as well as information on earning your CPE credit for attending today. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our featured presenter today is Slava Gomzen. He is the author of Hacking Point of Sale, Payment Application Secrets, Threats, and Solutions, and is the Security and Payments Technologist at Hewlett Packard. Prior to joining HP, Slava was a Security Architect and PCI ISA Corporate Product Security Officer and R&D and Application Security Manager at Retalix a division of NCR Retail. Now after Slava speaks, we'll be hearing from Ken Weston. He is Product Marketing Manager at Tripwire. Ken is a security researcher with 14 years of experience building and breaking things through the use and misuse of technology. His technology exploits and endeavors have been featured in numerous publications, and he is a regular contributor to Tripwire's State of Security blog. So thank you, presenters, for being with us today. And without further delay, I'd like to hand it over to our featured speaker, Slava. Take it away, Slava. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Tripwire team and especially Ken Weston for this uh, opportunity to speak about such an important topic. So we are going to start the presentation from Target Bridge, but uh, it's important to know that Target is just an example which is used because of its well-known name. Uh, any other retailers can be in the same situation as Target. And you should remember that Target is a victim as many other retailers. And uh, it's not just a victim of hackers, but uh, first of all, it's a victim of bad technology. The technology associated with magnetic stripe payment cards is insecure by design. So we will try to understand why PCI, which was supposed to protect this technology and its users, retailers, in reality failed to protect them. And finally, we will see what can be done in order to avoid uh, these breaches. So what's really happened at Target? Um, in order to understand that, let's first see who's actually discovered the Target breach. There are many security controls that are supposed to, if not prevent, but at least detect the card data breach. By the way, many of those uh, uh, security controls are recommended or even required by PCI standards. For example, antivirus and file integrity monitor. But in reality, the security controls are useless in the retail store environment. For example, antivirus cannot detect the point of sale malware because uh, before the attack, the hackers usually test their malware with all possible antivirus programs. There are special websites that uh, facilitate such a testing. And the file integrity monitoring is useless because hackers 
just fake digital signature or in many cases file integrity monitor doesn't even validate the signatures. This is just two examples. Uh, so it, it's easy to install the security tools, but it's very difficult to make them uh, effective in the retail store environment. So the target breach was discovered by Brian Krebs, journalist and security blogger. He's done a great research related to this breach and other card data breaches. And I'm not going deeply into the details around the, the breach itself because I really want to focus uh, on the cause of the breach. So if you want to know more specifics uh, about the breach and about the hackers, uh, I highly recommend uh, Brian's blog. It's Krebs on security.com. So I guess the fact that the biggest security breach was discovered by journalists demonstrates the, the state and the level of payment card data security. And there are some numbers just to show how big the, this disaster is. Uh, you can see that all the numbers are counted in millions. Again, if you want to know more details, uh, please go to uh, krebsonsecurity.com. So let's talk a little bit about the scenario of the attack itself. The important thing is that uh, the particular scenario actually doesn't matter. What hackers need is just penetrating the network. It doesn't matter how it's done. Once they're inside uh, the retailer's network, uh, this retailer is doomed because uh, the payment card technology is vulnerable by design and nothing inside the network prevents from the breach. Uh, the penetration can be done in many different ways. For example, the retailer's office employee can click on a link in the email message uh, and install the malware on, on its works, workstation. Or another common scenario, uh, which is probably was the actual case with target uh, attack, remote access to point of sale systems. Many point of sale software vendors or retailers themselves maintain a remote connection to the point of sale machines or servers inside the retail store. So they can either use weak credentials or hackers can exploit vulnerability in this remote access software. Again, it doesn't matter. There are many different ways to penetrate the network. So eventually hackers uh, infiltrate into the network and install their malware and point of sale machines and that's all they need. So let's take a look at the typical uh, payment application architecture. By the way, payment application can be part of the point of sale application code or separate application, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is the fact that most payment applications run on the same point of sale hardware, which means they share uh, resources such as memory uh, with the hosting point of sale machine. Most point of sale and payment applications run on well-known Windows operating system, which makes it even easier to, to create the malware. You can see that there are uh, multiple payment application models that interact uh, with each other and use hard drives and memory and communicate with the outside world. Um, first of all, payment application must touch the memory of hosting point of sale machine in order to process data. This type of data is called data in memory. Second, it must store temporary or for long term the data on hard drives. This type of data is called data at rest. And finally, payment application must communicate with outside world. Point of sale application, payment hardware, payment processor. And this is required in order to capture the cardholder data from point of sale or payment terminal and get online approval for transaction for, from payment processor. This type of data is called data in transit. So if we'll take a look at the simplified uh, payment application architecture diagram, we can see all these types of data, data in memory, data at rest, and data in transit. And we can see different instances of this. Uh, all these types of data are payment application vulnerability areas. Data in memory and data in transit are usually not encrypted at all and available in clear text. Data at rest is usually encrypted, but this encryption is implemented in software and so it's weak encryption. 
The problem is that at rest encryption is that payment application must both encrypt and decrypt the data on the same machine. For example, uh, temporary storage of cardholder data for offline transaction processing. In order to do both encryption and decryption on the same machine, the cryptographic keys must be symmetric and stored on the same machine. And there is no many places at the point of sale machine to store these keys. It can be either file or registry or hard code in the application code. In any case, whatever can be done by the payment application can be reversed by, by the malware. In case of target and many other attacks on retailers, that in memory was the easiest way to find and extract the cardholder data. So memory scraping, uh, which is also known as RAM scraping or memory parsing, is, uh, is the actual technology used for retrieving the sensitive payment card data from the memory of the payment application process. And uh, memory scraping is implemented in uh, specifically crafted malware, which, is, uh, which attacks payment applications by, by stealing cardholder information from the memory. There are special techniques uh, like uh, uh, regular expressions used to, uh, to search for uh, patterns of uh, cardholder data in, in, in memory, in big amounts of memory, and filter out just uh, track data and, and primary count numbers from the entire uh, stream of the memory. So most payment applications, if, even if they encrypt the secret fields, such as track one or track two or primary count number, if they encrypt it at rest and in transit, they still have, uh, they have such data and clear text in, in memory in order to retrieve parameters. They need to, in order to route transactions to particular payment processor or, or process uh, cashier or customer prompts, for example. So in this slide, uh, you can see the actual screenshot taken from WinHex uh, utility. Uh, this is the point of sale memory. Uh, WinHex is a forensic utility, but the same technique can be used uh, and actually used by malware to search and extract the cardholder data. In this screenshot, uh, it's taken from a Wireshark network sniffer. So this is uh, uh, against uh, data in transit. Uh, the network sniffer can be attached to the network router or point of sale machine or store server and can listen to the communication between point of sale and uh, other uh, application models or outside world. You can see actual track one highlighted by yellow color in this screenshot. And this information is, uh, is actual track one, and it's sufficient in order to duplicate the credit card. So let's see how PCI failed to protect Target and other retailers from security breaches. First of all, uh, let's define the terminology. There are four PCI standards, but when we say PCI, we usually mean PCI DSS, which is the standard for merchants and service providers. Other standards uh, are more specialized standards for software and hardware vendors. So we just uh, focus on uh, PCI DSS. The PCI standard was uh, the first one, and it was intended to protect merchants from the breaches. So merchants are required to implement different security controls in order to protect the payment technology, which is insecure by design. PCI DSS was created almost 10 years ago. Current version is version 3. There are no significant the first release. The idea behind PCI was, and still is, uh, the more PCI compliant merchants are there, the less is the risk of the security breach. But in practice, we can see that uh, the reality is completely different. So this is the statistics of card data breaches. Uh, there was a slight decline between 2007 and 2009. I think this is because retailers actually started implementing PCI 
which means they started encrypting data at rest, data on hard drives. This is the main PCI requirement. Before PCI, the easiest way to steal the cardholder data was uh, just taking it from, from the hard drive. Uh, point of sale application uh, was storing card data in, in log files and databases uh, around the, uh, the point of sale machines without any encryption. Uh, once they started encryption, uh, encrypting data at rest, the, the hackers also learned about PCI and they realized that data in memory and data in transit are still not encrypted. So in 2009, 2010, they just switched from data at rest to data in memory and, and data in transit. Now that the statistics do not include uh, breaches in 2013 when Target and many other breaches, breaches happened. In this table, we can see that there are many players responsible for compliance with uh, different uh, PCI standards, but it's, it's mainly users of payment applications who are responsible for actual security. And these users are merchants, and they're responsible for security of the entire retail store, not payment application vendors, and not payment processors, and not, not card brands, the merchants themselves. So merchants are responsible for protection uh, against uh, vulnerability areas uh, of payment applications. Uh, and on the left side in this table, uh, there is a more detailed breakdown of vulnerability areas uh, of payment applications. The problem is that merchants are not always qualified to implement uh, these security controls. Uh, it's difficult to implement firewall, for example, uh, on the store uh, local networks and isolate uh, literally thousands of point of sale machines from the rest of the corporate network. And single error in firewall configuration can cause a security breach because there is nothing else uh, behind the firewall that can stop the attack. And this title shows how PCI DSS protects the vulnerability areas of uh, payment applications. And you can see that uh, basically just single area data at rest is actually fully covered by PCI requirements, uh, requirement number three. Uh, data in transit is covered only partially. Uh, there's no, uh, there's a requirement to encrypt the data on public networks such as internet, but in, in most cases, the card data is sent on internal local networks. So payment application vendors are not required to encrypt it. And in fact, they don't do it on, in many cases. Uh, data in memory is not protected at all. There's no any requirement to protect data in memory in PCI. And as I said before, uh, it's technic technically very difficult to protect it. That's why the memory scraping is the main method of attacks today. So uh, many PCI security controls are introduced in order to uh, compensate uh, for a problem with memory protection. Uh, and merchants are supposed to implement uh, various security measures in order to block access to the memory. But these security controls are either not effective enough or difficult to implement correctly. So if PCI DSS doesn't protect us, what actually can be done in order to prevent the breach? First of all, uh, separation between point of sale and payment application. Most legacy point of sale applications have uh, implemented payment functions inside the point of sale code itself. Or even if the point of sale uh, and payment applications are separate, uh, they are running uh, at the same machine, at, at the same physical point of sale machine. So this is typical architecture diagram of the point of sale and payment application running on the same hardware, on the same point of sale machine. You can see that point of sale and payment software share the same memory and the same hard drive. So if point of sale machine is compromised, the payment application is automatically compromised as well. This diagram shows uh, an alternative uh, deployment approach uh, when point of sale and payment applications 
are separated, not just logically, but uh, also physically. The payment device can communicate with the payment application using local network. In this configuration, if point of sale machine is compromised, the payment application is still not exposed to the attack. So it's much easier to protect single server in the store than multiple point of sale machines. But the, the server is still uh, vulnerable, so, so without additional measures, this architecture still does not provide a full, complete level of security. Point-to-point -point encryption is another technology which provides much higher level of security. By the way, separation between point-of-sale and payment application at least logical separation is uh, still required in order to implement point-to-point uh, -point encryption. And this is the high-level architecture diagram uh, illustrating the typical point-to-point -point encryption solution. Um, the main idea uh, behind the point-to-point -point encryption is that it's much easier to protect single data center than uh, multiple retail stores and multiple point-of-sale machines. So the sensitive card holder data is encrypted inside the hardware, in payment terminal, uh, in this case, in, in this uh, diagram, or can be uh, attached or detached MSR, magnetic stripe reader. Uh, and the data in clear text will never touch the, the store system and, and go directly to the data center. In the data center, the data is encrypted in, in special cryptographic hardware. Uh, it's called uh, HSM. Uh, you can see it on the diagram, uh, the hardware security model. So the data is encrypted in hardware, and that is decrypted in hardware. And if, if this uh, solution is implemented correctly, it's very difficult, it's almost impossible to, to retrieve the encryption keys because both encryption hardware at the point of sale and decryption hardware at the data center um, protect the, the cryptographic keys and they have a temper resistant uh, model. So if someone tries to retrieve these keys physically, it, it, they will be destroyed. And it's, it's uh, difficult to, to retrieve these keys uh, through, through the network connection or any other logical connection. So point to point uh, encryption solution provides the, the highest level of security for payment systems. And finally, AMV is another way to, to protect the payment card transactions. It's also called chip and pin or chip and signature, depending on specific implementation. And, uh, uh, but the problem uh, with AMV is that uh, it's not commonly adopted in, in the US. It is common technology in Europe and many other countries, but not in the US yet. So there, there are signs of movement towards AMV, especially after recent retail card data breaches. But uh, card, and card brands try to facilitate the AMV adoption by some incentives like uh, PCI audit relief and liability shift. So the retailers who will, will be able to accept AMV card will not be required to go through PCI audit anymore and will not be financially responsible uh, for card fraud. But the, the big question is, does AMV really resolve all the security problems? So the short answer is no, because there are several exceptions uh, associated with the AMV. First of all, AMV does not provide security for online transactions. Even if you have a, a card with the chip, if you go to shop online, you still need to key manually the, the card number embossed on the, on the card. So AMV technology doesn't work uh, for, for e-commerce. Second problem, uh, AMV does not require data encryption. So that is still transferred in clear text between point of sale and payment processor. And actually, the, the primary account number uh, and part of the track data can be still captured by malware. So point-to-point -point encryption is still recommended to protect this data. Another issue is uh, EMV cards still have magnetic stripe for fallback processing. In cases that there is no, for example, there is no terminal that accepts EMV, that cannot read the chip, 
uh, the, the card holder can still uh, swipe the card. And uh, in, in many cases, there the, are uh, known vulnerabilities already that payment terminals can be actually triggered to to switch to fallback mode to, to prompt customer to swipe the card uh, instead of uh, reading the chip. So in this case, the card data can be just stolen uh, in the same way as uh, it's with the magnetic stripe. And the last one, uh, AMV vulnerabilities uh, probably will be exploited once U.S. adopts the AMV cards. So currently there is no need to hack uh, EMV because there, there is a, uh, a lot of magnetic stripe data available to, uh, in the U.S. merchants, so hackers are focused on, on primary on the U.S. merchants. And there are NV context list uh, vulnerabilities already demonstrated in security conference. So once the U.S. will start adopting AMV, hackers probably will switch uh, to the AMV technology. So I guess that's all I have for today. And thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Slava. So uh, this is Ken Weston with Trefire. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, we're gonna, um, we'll ask some questions. I'm gonna get, give a quick presentation and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, ask some questions to Slava. Um, so I actually first reached out to Slava after reading um, his book and I found it to be an excellent resource, uh, not just for those that are involved on the technical aspects of securing point of sale, uh, but also those involved on the business side. Um, if you have not picked the book up yet, I highly recommend it. Um, we actually have a sample chapter available on, on our website. Uh, we will be sending a link out um, in a follow-up email with a link to that after the webcast here. Um, so, you know, when the target breach happened, we had a lot of questions from customers, prospects, and the press um, regarding how it happened and uh, what they could do to prevent it. So I wanted to take a few minutes to discuss some of the things we learned uh, about the breach and some things retailers can do to help reduce and um, uh, increase the likelihood of their ability to detect breaches similar to target. Uh, so no single technology or tool will mitigate all potential threats and breaches in retail environments. Um, there are no silver bullets. Um, however, providing a multi-layered approach to security goes a long way in reducing the attack surface and providing visibility to changes and events in your environment. By combining log intelligence, vulnerability data, and security configuration and change data, it provides unified, unified security intelligence that gives us visibility and insight into changes, events, and overall security posture of our environment. Through the combined data model, and we are able to continuously monitor and answer specific questions with confidence, such as what systems are vulnerable, what systems are being attacked, uh, which have already been compromised, and which, which should we fix first? Um, and also, have we seen this before, and what, um, when was that system last in a trusted state? Let me kind of build this out here. So for retailers defending yourself against the, the sophisticated threats like we've seen with um, some of the more uh, complex malware, um, you know, and other threats that are coming from both inside and outside your network, it requires a strategy that combines multiple security controls to enable better visibility and awareness of your environment, including devices, applications, and even users. Uh, Tripwire delivers the most comprehensive security controls for merchants, uh, providing your organization with the tools it needs to detect, prevent, and respond to threats by correlating changes, um, events, and vulnerabilities, and providing actionable intelligence through alerts, actions, and even automated remediation. Tripwire monitors everything in your environment, from your servers, security appliances, all the way down to point-of-sale systems with our lightweight, high-performing, and persistent monitoring agents. waiting for the slides here to catch up. So uh, with the target breach, we know that the source of the breach uh, was thought to be a trusted business partner uh, who had access to their network you know, for specific applications. Um, so these credentials were compromised through a phishing attack utilizing the Citadel Banking Trojan. Although we don't know how the privileges were escalated, it is safe to assume that uh, unpatched application or system vulnerabilities were exploited within the organization at Target. The fact they did not have um, the network, <coughs> sorry, the fact that they did not have um, the, the network vendor separated from uh, the point of sale, it's quite troubling, um, the fact that those two networks were not separated. Additionally, it should have had logging in place to monitor and keep track of any vendor activity on that network. 
Um, with TRIPWIRE Log Center, we actually have rules in place out of the box that helps organizations monitor um, actively, closely, um, anything that's actually happening by those users on the network. We also have TRIPWIRE IP360, which is our vulnerability management solution that's used by organizations to monitor and track where their systems are vulnerable so you can see what an attacker would see once they're actually inside the network. So in an attack against a retailer, it's important to catch attackers in the act, as this is the point at which you have the best chance of mitigating the attacker. If we uh, take a look at the typical process an attacker goes through, at the recon and enumeration phase, such as uh, when the group was attacking Target, working through their HVAC vendor, um, it's difficult to detect their behavior until they actually touch the network. Um, at the exploitation at the exploitation and entrenchment phase of the target attack, the group had roughly two weeks they could exfiltrate the data, increasing the chances of catching them if, they had, um, if they'd had the right detective tools in place. In the case of target, the breach was only detected well after the exfiltration occurred and the attackers covered their tracks to some degree, leaving it to fraud analysts to detect the breach when the cards started flooding the underground markets. Once this occurred, it still took target months to fully understand the scale of the breach. So given the scale of the breach and the number of systems were compromised, we can assume that um, the infected code was deployed uh, to POS devices through a server set up specifically for patching deployment to the devices. Um, this process occurs usually late at night uh, and uh, with limited human interaction. So it really serves as a great attack vector to quickly deploy malware to devices, to devices while deploying, um, while completely avoiding detection. So if we look at this a level deeper, so the malware is deployed at the point of sale, and it's you know it's polymorphic, so it wasn't picked up by antivirus. Um, you know that malware was then de uh, deployed to all the point of sale devices. So then from there we see that um, all these devices are now infected. However. What happened was every time a credit card was swiped is there was actually a file that actually had that credit card appended to it. So it may have been read out of memory, but it was also stored on a file on those devices. So that information, there was then a, a file share that was created, and then that information was then exfiltrated out of the organization. So again, that's another chance that um, Target could have detected that. So this time I'm going to uh, go through this again with Tripwire Enterprise. So we have the same uh, polymorphic malware which we uh, probably would have detected um, at the patch uh, server level. And then every single time that got deployed or changed to those uh, systems, when those cards were swiped, we would have detected those file changes and would have alerted um, the security team that something was wrong. In addition, uh, security policies can be set up so that there were no, um, those devices could not create a file share at all. So the information could not have been breached. So those uh, credit card numbers were sitting on the file share for six days. Um, and that information, if they would have caught up before then, would have never um, actually gotten down into the underground markets um, had they not had that file share in place. So we all know, as uh, Slava has shown us, that PCI compliance does not mean security. It's a checkbox and only one factor of the security and compliance chain that retailers are faced with. As an authority on the implementation of PCI compliance solutions, we know a thing or two about the difficulties of securing retail store chains. Um, early on, we realized the importance of retailers not only attaining their initial report on compliance, but also to maintain compliance state and further improve their security posture over time through the implementation of key security controls. Most enterprise organizations only deal with a data center, which can be challenging enough, um, but it's generally straightforward and is also something many uh, vendors are comfortable implementing. Uh, you usually are dealing with a limited number of assets and applications and only in a few different locations. However, once you in introduce multiple stores to the mix, the complexity makes it much more difficult to secure and keep in compliance. 
To give you an idea of scale and complexity retailers face, uh, one of our customers, a large de um, department store chain, came with us with a number of devices spread out across the uh, country, which was comprised of roughly 1,000 stores, over 3,000 point-of-sale um, servers within the store, uh, 40,000 point-of-sale uh, endpoint devices, 200-plus uh, servers, uh, and roughly 2,800 workstations at a call center. Um, retail in particular has a great deal of complexity, not just limited to point of sale, but also data centers and a mixed variety of devices and logistical challenges to deal with. Tripwire can help your organization secure your environment from, um, at the point of sale endpoint all the way through your IT infrastructure. If you would like a demo or le to learn more about how we can help, please fill out our contact form on our website, and we're happy to discuss how Tripwire can help secure your environment and uh, provide peace of mind. So with that, I'd uh, like to open it up for questions here, and uh, we do have a, a few here. Um, so, uh, let's see. so one for Slava. This is good. Um, uh, um, are there uh, are the temporary one-time credit card numbers um, going to be in common? Are they going to be common in the future? And do you think it would increase or decrease uh, the rate of fraud? Well. Yeah, that's a good question. The temporary uh, credit card numbers is one of the uh, techniques to prevent uh, uh, card fraud. Uh, the problem with temporary number is that it's uh, difficult to use it in brick and mortar uh, stores. So it's mo technology mostly intended to, to protect uh, uh, online transactions. Uh, so in case of Target and other brick and mortar retailers breaches, it, it probably it, it will not be helpful. And mm -hmm. second, uh, for online transactions, it's not really um, uh, convenient technology because there's some uh, some software that should be uh, installed on, on the client machine or running in the browser that generated the numbers. So, so it's, it's not really convenient technology. Okay. Great. And uh, so there's a, a good question here. How exactly does uh, um, EMV or chip and uh, pin cards work, and what makes it relatively more secure? Well, that, that's a question for, I guess, for an entire separate uh, uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's really not simple to, to, to explain how EMV works in, in a couple of sentences. But they, they, basically, it's uh, um, the main idea behind uh, EMV is that instead of magnetic stripe, uh, the, the chip is uh, embedded into the plastic card. So the card data is stored securely on the chip itself. And it's not so easy to, to access this chip and retrieve uh, cardholder information from the chip. And magnetic stripe can, stripe can be uh, uh, read by, by any device any magnetic stripe reader that you can buy on eBay for uh, $50. Okay. Great. Uh, so there's a question for uh, me. Um, so with Tripwire or similar tools, what would be a realistic time period to discover research um, to confirm whether or not there's a problem? That's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, tools out there that, you know, they do the file integrity monitoring, you know, they monitor, but usually the scans they do are very intermittent. Um, I've even heard of some scans um, only being run once a month to identify any sort of changes within the environment. Um, and actually that's a, a big uh, differentiator with Tripwire because what we do is continuous monitoring. So it's um, pretty much all the scanning and reporting that we provide, particularly with the agent, um, it's, it's pretty much near real time. Um, and also when you have to go through and start doing the forensic side uh, when there is a problem, um, you need to make sure that you have that information backed up as well as the, the tools available to do um, the, the searches. So um, with Tripwire Log Center, we have um, quite a bit of forensic capability as well as through Tripwire Enterprise. There's a pretty tight integration there um, that actually can correlate any sort of file changes as well as other security events. Um, and actually you can go back, um, not just in, you know, in real time, but be able to go back in history to identify, okay, here's a vendor account um, they got in, um, what other systems did they touch? Um, you know, a really good example of why that's important would be with um, PF Chang's, for example. Um, you know, they got to a point with their breach that um, they didn't know what they could trust. Um, they didn't know the scope of the breach. They didn't know um, how deep it actually went, what systems were infected, um, so much to the point that they actually had to send out the old uh, carbon copy, you know, hand uh, credit card.
card uh, processing systems to their uh, stores. So you want to talk about you know, the impact of continuous monitoring to a business, um, and I think that's, that's a really good example of it, um, is you know, having these tools in place to not only you know, detect when there is a breach, but also to be able to you know, have the forensic tools to go back and identify um, just how um, deep that breach was, how long you've been compromised. Um, it's really critical for an organization um, to help establish trust you know, for their customers as well. Um, when you can, can't even tell them how, um, how deep the breach is, um, you know, it's going to make them be a little more uh, reticent to uh, share their credit card number with you in the, in the future. Uh, let's see, some more questions here. So uh, a question for you, Slava. Um, are there no periodic audits or continuous monitoring in a typical retail environment? And does PCI DSS not mandate these? Well, uh, PCI DSS does mandate this, but uh, the problem is uh, a, a periodic audit that uh, usually happens once a year, as far as I remember. But it really doesn't matter if, if you even do it every month. Uh, there is uh, enough time between these uh, audits uh, to, to, to break something because single error in uh, configuration of single firewall and single store can cause the security breach. Okay, great. Uh, so another question for Slava. Um, if a firewall is placed at point of entry and rules are created to allow limited traffic um, out to specifically authorized um, IP address of the credit card data or its processors, would that be good form? Is that something that's practiced? And that's exactly what uh, PCI requires, and that's what retailers do. But uh, the reality is that it, it <laughs> doesn't work. It doesn't prevent uh, retailers from, from breaches. Okay. Uh, and then the, this is a good question. Uh, can I increase security uh, for my US-based chip equipped EMV card by scraping off the magnetic media on the card? Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, well, theoretically, yes, I guess, because if you destroy the magnetic stripe, it, it's not, there's no, it's not connected to the chip in any way. It's completely separate uh, entity, so Basically, your data is not going to be present on, on the magnetic stripe anymore. And yeah, that's that's interesting. <laughs> we need to suggest it to <laughs> to uh, card issuers. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Getting a lot of great feedback from uh, folks here. Um, so uh, here's a good question: Do um, NFC payment technologies like ISIS and Google Wallet? Uh, compromise uh, contactless the contactless part of EMV. Um, NFC does not compromise the, the EMV. It uh, well, it, it's not a simple question because th th there are different implementations of, of NFC. There is a NFC contactless with regular magnetic cards and and contactless with EMV cards. So the, the first one, uh, e, uh, NFC with a uh, magnetic stripe card, it works exactly as a regular magnetic stripe. So the same data is sent, but it, instead of uh, swiping the card, uh, the, the card just sends uh, wirelessly the, the same data to the uh, payment terminal. So it's, it's um, vulnerable in the same way as a regular magnetic stripe card. Now, NFC with EMV actually, is uh, the EMV data is also translated wirelessly instead of uh, inserting the card into the chip reader. But there are some uh, additional vulnerabilities that uh, NFC uh, introduced. And in fact, there are uh, 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 actual attacks that were demonstrated even two, three years ago on security conference uh, using NFC. So I, I would not use, uh, I would not recommend using NFC today. 
So, so I have a question, a personal question. You know, you, your uh, your book was excellent. Um, it was really well written. Again, I think it's a uh, it's it's a must read for anyone that's involved in uh, point of sale transactions. Um, you know, what is it that uh, motivated you to to write the book? Well, I, I tried to explain it in, in the introduction, but basically, I just. Uh, at some point, uh, I was working on the implementation of payment interfaces with, with the development team. Uh, they were great uh, programmers, but they, they had no experience with payment systems and with security, and especially with security of payment systems. So I just realized that there is no uh, any training materials um, uh, available for, for uh, 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 yeah, cases like this. So that was one reason, and another reason I just wanted to to share my my uh, thoughts about uh, uh, PCI and its place in in, in the current uh, payment application security. Great. So now that you're uh, an established author, do you have any other books that you're going to be working on, or? Uh, well, yes. Uh, it's not completely official yet, but I'm working on another book. Uh, uh, it will be published by Wiley. It's, uh, this time it's going to be about uh, Bitcoin payments. Oh, great. Excellent. Great. And I think that, that about wraps up our, our questions. Um, there's some other questions here. We're going to try to answer some of those. We'll probably send it to you individually. Um, there are a lot of questions um, you know, about the name of the book, and the name of the book is um, Hacking Point of Sale. Um, and we will be sending out a sample chapter um, in a follow-up email as well as links to the slides. Um, so. All right. Thank you, Ken. And thank you all today for listening in and for your participation. We had a lot of questions, as Ken just said. We hope that you found the presentation informative and interesting. We'd really like to thank our featured presenter, Slava Gomzin, and to uh, our own Tripwires, uh, Ken Weston. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand webcast and the slides, as well as